Lord, there's so many things as we talked about this morning that we don't know how to handle. We don't think we possibly can handle. But thank you that your grace is sufficient, that your, our, your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Tonight, again, I pray, Lord, help us to learn about your precious Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, if you were physically with us tonight in this room, oh, what a wonderful thing that would be. And I'm sure there's not a person here that wouldn't wind up staying till after midnight just to listen to you talk and to be with you. And what a, what a magnificent thing it would be. We can't even... We can't even imagine how wonderful it would be. But when it was time to go, only one household out of all of us would, have, would be able to take you home because you lived like we do on this earth in a physical body. But Lord, I thank you that when we leave tonight, every one of us that knows Christ will take your Holy Spirit home with us. And we will have your Holy Spirit with us throughout the week to face every challenge, to understand and find the solution to every problem, to navigate every day, every moment of every day. Thank you for that. Lord, you know we handicap ourselves by not believing. By not having the full trust that the Spirit of God lives within us every moment. And I pray that you would help us to make progress in overcoming that handicap tonight. Bless our time in your word, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me back up just a little bit and cover some of the ground that we've covered. Now, I'm not going all the way back. We have now, up to last week, just in chapter 14, 22 statements that we've looked at. And we're not going to review those. But I do want to go back and remind you, verse number 10, Jesus says to his disciples, Believe thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And he urges them to believe that he and the Father are one. And then he goes on to say why that's so important. Verse 12, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. So he's telling them why it's so urgent that they believe. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. We said last week that the, the, the reason that Jesus' disciples would do greater works was because, number one, Jesus would not be around as they took the gospel to the whole world. And number two, Jesus would never preach the cross and the empty tomb. That was for the disciples who would outlive him. So the great work, you know, we're so fascinated by miracles. And Jesus downplays the role that miracles play in our lives. I won't go down that road, but Jesus is more about the message and the faith. And the greater works that the disciples would do, yes, the apostles would have gifts. And yes, God's people can, through, through prayer, see God do great things. But the greatest works are the works of influence, the works of changed lives. And when you stand at about 30, 40 A.D., and turn around not knowing the history of the last 2,000 years. And think about this band of 120 Christians 
mostly working class living, as we would say, paycheck to paycheck. Mostly uneducated. I don't mean that they couldn't read and write, but they'd never been to the universities. This band of men that the world would laugh at, they impacted the world for the next 2,000 years. Name for me a group of people in the history of the world besides Christians who have had a dominant 2,000-year impact on the world. You can't because they don't exist. I mean, you can come up with a stupid answer, not, not you, of course, but a, but a cynic. Well, what about Greek mythology? That's older than Christianity. Yeah. Whose life is that changing today? What nations are being changed by, I remember one time um, dealing with a, a, a liberal couple, and I had dealt with the man. The man was patient, but he was very liberal in his thinking. I dealt with him for a period of about two years before I met his wife. And he'd been telling his wife about this nut that he'd been interacting with. And finally, I got the chance to meet her because I was driving them to the airport. And she started going on and on about Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. In other words, making the comparison to Jesus. And the man, the liberal man said, um, like under his breath so I wouldn't hear I don't think there's any comparison there. I, you know, you might want to back off on that. You're really sounding stupid right now. There's nobody who compares to what Christians have done in the world over the last 2,000 years. Greater works! Jesus didn't take the gospel of the whole world. Jesus preached inside of the nation of Israel. That was his mission. He didn't fail. That was his mission. But you guys, and here he's talking to 11. He's not talking to 120. He's talking to 11 here. He said, would you please believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me because greater works than I've done, you will do. Man. Read the beginning of Fox's Book of Martyrs. I beg you to read that book. The beginning of Fox, and of course it's not inspired. It's not doesn't have the authority of Scripture, but it's an accurate history. And it tells you where every one of the disciples went and how they died. Do you know one of the 11 got all the way to Great Britain? That's one reason, by the way, as you study Christianity, the country of Wales, the country of Scotland, they had all, they have been always a powerhouse of Christianity. They have been a home base of the New Testament church. Why? Because the, one of the disciples got there in the very first generation of Christianity. Greater works than I do. Shall he do also? He, who? The person who believes that I am who I say I am. Okay, so he goes on to say, as a part of this greater works thing, first of all, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name. That is not disconnected from the greater works. Under the greater works mission, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in me, in, in the Son. And he repeats it in verse 14, and then he gives just a little clause. Remember, we talked about this last week. If you love me, keep my commandments. That is totally off the subject unless it's connected to ask anything in my name. So Jesus is saying, if you want to make a claim at asking anything in my name, well, you got to love me. And you show that you love me by keeping my commandments. And I, we ended last week by going to John, 1 John and seeing the Apostle John figured that out. Because when he quotes this in his epistle 60 years later, he says, if we ask anything according to his will. 
John understood that Jesus isn't just saying, use my name like a magic word. Uh, yeah, like a magic word. If you use my name, it's like spoofle dust or a magic wand or whatever. No, it's not what Jesus is saying. If you love me and you're wrapped up in my mission, then when you go to the Father and pray in my name, he will do whatever you ask for. If you love me and you're wrapped up in the mission. And by the way, if you love me and you're wrapped up in the mission, you won't ask for stupid stuff. You won't say, oh, God, please give me a Ferrari. God said, well, you know, you're, you're not even praying to the right God, dude. You don't even know what's going on. No, you'll go to God and say, oh, God, please. Please save my brother. And God says, well, that's part of the mission right there. And those are the things that he will answer. All right, so that's the first thing that God said he would do connected to the mission. Now tonight, here's the second. Verse number 16. And, okay, and it's still connected to the mission, the greater things mission. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now we're just going to go verses 15, uh, 16 and 17, and I'm going to give you eight statements from these two verses tonight that I hope open your eyes a little bit. First statement tonight. Now, we have 22 already, so the first statement tonight is overall statement number 23. Not that you care or need to know, but I need to know, okay? So I'm, from now on, I'm not going to say first statement. I'm going to say number 23. Because when we're all done, I don't know how many we're going to have by the time we get to the end of chapter 16. Hope it's only in double digits, lest I run out of ink. But anyway, number 23. As a part of greater things, God the Father will give Jesus' disciples an advocate. Now, the word advocate means somebody who is legally in your corner. An advocate, God the Holy Spirit, to do the work that he, God the Son, had done for them. See, because here's another thing that Jesus is persuading his disciples. I'm about to leave, but I'm not going to leave you alone. And that's why he says another comforter. Now, it's hard because we're addicted to our eyes and our ears and our hands. We're addicted to seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting. It's hard for us to comprehend that an unseen, unhearable, untouchable, holy spirit, whatever that is, could take the place of a physical miracle worker who walked on water, raised the dead, but Jesus said, would you please listen to me? I am going to send you another comforter. Another, not me. By the way, I don't get too crazy with the Greek, but this, here's one case where I think it's helpful to understand. In fact, I think this might be the first lesson I ever learned in Greek. I took Greek when I was in high school. And I think this might be the first lesson I ever learned. That the word another has two Greek, two different Greek, there are two different kinds of Greek another's. There is another of a different kind, and there is a word that means another of the same kind. Okay, so if you, if you said, um, uh, man, I dropped, my, I dropped my lunch in the garbage can. And you said, could you help me out? What was your lunch? Peanut butter and jelly. You can't beat peanut butter and jelly for lunch. Anyway, um, unless the apple squishes, the, then, it's, then it's nasty. Then, then your peanut butter and jelly sandwich bleeds, and then your paper bag bleeds, and it's horrible. But as long as everything is the way it's supposed to be, you can't beat. You, you may disagree, but you're wrong. You can't beat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. 
but you dropped it by accident. I don't know, it fell in the dumpster, it fell down the sewer, it got ruined. And you, you, you come to me, I don't know why you would come to me, I'm a pastor, but you'd come to me and you say, uh, I lost my lunch. Can you give me another one? Okay, I could give you another one of a different kind. Sure, here's, um, here's some leftover, you know, uh, <laughs> here's some leftover corned beef and cabbage and, and uh, sauerkraut. <laughs> no, thank you. Or if I said, guess what? I called your mom. And this is the exact same lunch she made for you. I mean, what? think about it. I can tell you what the best, um, like I said, peanut butter and jelly, a banana that's just a little bit too ripe. Yeah, that, that was great in my, in my lunch. And I always got a sandwich, always had fruit, and I always had dessert. And when I was a kid, my favorite dessert, I think, to have my, was to open up one of two things, either a snack pack pudding or back in those days, ho-hos or yodels were wrapped in aluminum foil. Yeah. And, man, when you opened up, the, if I had to choose between my apple squishing my peanut butter and jelly sandwich or squishing my yodel, you can squish the sandwich. I want my yodel whole, Right. Anyway, a little in-depth, too much in-depth on that, okay? So, but I called your mom, and you asked for another lunch, and I made you exactly the same kind of peanut butter and jelly sandwich on exactly the same kind of bread, cut it exactly the way she did, gave you exactly the same kind of piece of fruit, and exactly the same dessert. That would be another of the same kind. So there's another of a different kind. Oh, I'm sorry, you lost your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but here's some, here's some leftover corned beef, which to some of you sounds great, but, you know, to an eight-year-old, nah, nah. Here's some leftover. Here's another one. No, that's, another, that's a different one. Or there's another one of the same kind. The word here, another comforter, is another of the exact same kind, meaning the comforter that my father's going to send is not one bit different from me. Can I remind you, you have the spirit of God living in you, and he is exactly the same as, you live, as if you lived every day in person with Jesus. I wish we believed that. I wish I fully believed that. I'll consent to it all day long. I'll, I'll check the box all day long. But I wish that in my heart I was fully convinced that I have someone living inside me who is exactly the same as Jesus Christ. He is. So, as part of greater things, God the Father will give Jesus' disciples an advocate, God the Holy Spirit, to do the work that he, God the Son, had done for them. God the Holy Spirit would be an empowerer, an encourager, and an intercessor. And all that we get from what we know about, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Number 24 God, now get this, I, and I'm only, I don't know what there is to draw from this. I'm just pointing it out because it's what the Bible says. God the Father would send God the Holy Spirit to them in answer to the prayers of God the Son. Yeah, I find it curious that Jesus is spelling all of this out with the roles of each of the persons of the Trinity. He didn't just say, well, let me tell you, boys, the whole dispensation is about to change. We're about to transition into the church age. And I will no longer be the primary agent of the Godhead on earth. The Father will not be the primary agent of the Godhead on earth as he was in the Old Testament. Starting at Pentecost, the whole, this is the plan. This is the eternal plan. Starting at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God will be the eternal agent of the Godhead on the earth. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going away. But, but don't worry. I'm going to ask the Father 
to send you someone who is exactly like me, only he's not going to just be with you. He's going to be in you. And my father will answer. It's just curious to me that Jesus said it that way. It's like he's going through all the details of this is how it's going to work. I'm going to go back to heaven. And I'm going to go to my father. And I'm going to say, now they need somebody down there just like me. And he's going to say, okay, I will send the comforter, capital C, the comforter. And he's going to be what I have been. That's what's going on here. Number 25, God the Holy Spirit would stay with Jesus' disciples forever. The end of verse 16. That he may abide with you forever. As opposed to Jesus, I'm about to leave. Now you say, well, what about Jesus saying, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee in the person of the Holy Spirit? See, again, there's a distinction. Jesus is not here physically, but there's no difference. Jesus is here in the person of the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus said to, was it Philip? Don't you get it? You've seen the Father. You've been looking at the Father. He says to us, don't tell me you don't know Jesus Christ. He lives inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit. That reminds me. Time for a dumb joke. You ready? Can you take it? I heard Paul Harvey tell this. I don't know if it's true or if it's just a cute little story he read in the Reader's Digest. But back, how many of you remember when Barney was like the biggest thing on the planet? Yeah, the big purple dinosaur, Barney, he ruled the world for about a year. And so it was during that era that I heard Paul Harvey say on the radio, he said, uh, he, she went, this little girl went to the doctor, and the doctor was giving her a physical. She was, you know, five years old, whatever. And uh, so he was trying to make her feel comfortable with the physical and everything, and he took the stethoscope, and he, he said, oh, what's that I hear? She said, what? He said, do I hear Barney in your heart? And she said, no, Jesus is in my heart. Barney's on my underpants. But anyway, uh, little, little PG-13 joke there from Pastor. God, the Holy Spirit, would stay with Jesus' disciples forever. Now get this, verse, uh, number 26, verse 17. Even the spirit of truth. Even the spirit of truth. Number 26. God the Holy Spirit is the agent of truth in this world. Teaching and convincing people of what is true and distinguishing truth from error. That's what is meant by the title, the spirit of truth. Now. If you grew up in church, you have been around more truth than you have error. So you may not realize what a precious thing it is that you possess the truth and you're able to recognize the truth. I am so tempted, and I could still be pushed over the line, to pull out the testimony that I read to our students last Monday of the uh, woman on Twitter. I don't follow her, but somebody had retweeted, if you know how that works, and if, if they retweet, you see, you see what somebody else wrote that you don't follow. And she said, in case there's somebody reading this who hasn't heard my story yet, let me give it to you. And she gives the most amazing story of how, I'm going to do it, okay? You push me over the line. You push me over the line. Uh, that's not my phone. That's my phone. Could you grab my phone for me? I'm going to do it. You're, you're going to be glad I did this. It's not that long, but this is an example of someone, thank you, who grew up in error and the spirit of truth turned on the light for her. I'm pretty sure I send it. Here's what I do. When I want to find something again, I send it to my own text, and I hope I did that with this. Uh, no, I didn't, but I can find it. Yes, I can find it 
in case you care, because I liked it. And when you like something, uh, oh, and she, she liked back what I liked, which means it will be in my notifications. Please be in my notifications. There it is. This is her, this is the, the woman's uh, Twitter handle, the feminist turned housewife. Isn't that great? Here it is. Okay, listen to this. This will take about two minutes, maybe three. Since there are many new people here, I thought I'd share the story of how I came to Christ once again. I grew up in a non-believing home. My dad hated Christianity, and my mom was into all the new age practices and beliefs. I had no respect for Christians. I remember in high school making fun of girlfriends and enjoying asking them difficult questions and watching them struggle to give an account for their faith. It's an awful thing to admit, but I thought Christians were silly and that only stupid people would ever believe and follow Christian beliefs. I thought myself superior in intellect and above these people. Like most atheists, I acted this way and was very much convinced I was on the right side of things. I went to college and things only got worse. I had struggled since early high school with depression and awful anxiety. I hated myself. I had no joy or peace. I was constantly looking for meaning and trying. Isn't it a heartbreak? People looking for meaning, but they look towards Christ and say, but I know it's not that. I was constantly looking for meaning and trying to fill the void I had in my heart. In college, I tried to do that with drugs, being promiscuous, feminism, liberalism, all these different ideologies that I hoped would give me some meaning in life only made me more and more miserable and only pushed me further away from Christ. This led me down the road of absolute hate for any traditional values. I was a fat, blue-haired liberal that hated Republicans. Your liberal stereotype, that was me. Society kept telling me, these are the good values you should follow. We are the good people and the moral ones. And I kept believing the lie, even though I kept getting more and more miserable. My depression only got worse, and I had suicidal thoughts for many years. Things finally started to change when I met my now husband. He was an atheist, but he had conservative values. I remember thinking, this dude would be perfect if only he were a liberal. While dating him, he started to show me the truth behind all the lies that I had been force-fed for years, all the way from public schools to the shows I watched on TV. My eyes started to open, and I started to wonder what else was, was, was I wrong about. We moved to Texas, and that is when our lives changed. I met for the first time ever a Christian man who was able to defend and argue for the faith. He had an answer to all of my questions. He was the first person to ever explain to me the gospel. I had never heard it. I knew Jesus had died on a cross, but I didn't know why. I didn't understand why. When this man finally told me, once I finally heard the gospel, I knew it was true. Man, you know what that is? That's the spirit of truth. Once I finally heard the gospel, I knew it was true. I knew Jesus had died for me, that he loved me, that life actually had a purpose, that I wasn't just a random chance occurrence of random atoms. I had been created by a perfect, holy God who wanted to know me, a God that came to find me. I remember driving home after, and I experienced true peace and true joy for the first time in my life. I had happiness in my heart I could never possibly explain. The black hole in my heart had been filled by the one thing it was created to carry, Jesus Christ. My husband also got saved. We got married shortly after, found an amazing church, had babies, and continue to try to live the best way we can for Jesus. God still saves wicked sinners. If he can change the heart of someone like me and restore them, give them peace and joy, he can also save you. Please have courage to give someone the gospel. It really saves lives. The game changer in that story First of all, someone who was willing to share the gospel. 
But the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, took the message and opened that girl's eyes. And now she's a Christian wife, Christian mom, loving the Lord, serving the Lord, living for the Lord. God, the Holy Spirit, is the agent of truth in this world, teaching and convincing people of what is true and distinguishing truth from error. The second part of 17b, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth them not, neither knoweth him. Number 27, unbelievers by their unbelief have no interaction with, nor perception of, nor understanding of God the Holy Spirit. When an when a unbelieving person hears you talk about the fact that the Spirit of God lives within you. It's the stupidest thing they've ever heard. Why? Because they have no interaction with Him. Now get this, last part of verse 17. But ye know Him. Wait a second. I bet the, the disciples were saying, no. No, we don't. And maybe you're saying, I don't know if I do. Okay? Do you believe God's truth? Then you know the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of truth, and nobody can believe the truth without him. You know how I know God created the world? I don't, I don't know either. I just know. You know how I know the Bible is the word of God? Oh, I mean, I could make arguments for creation. I could make arguments for the Bible is the word of God. Probably better arguments than most people could make. Because I've thought about it my entire life. But I don't know that this is the word of God because of those arguments. I know it because I just know it. Because the spirit of truth has persuaded me. And if you know and believe the truth then you know the Holy Spirit because he's the only one that can convince you of the truth. Believers, as evidenced by their belief, know God the Holy Spirit. And then look at the last part. of No, actually, there's two more parts of uh, verse 17. For he dwelleth with you. Now, here's another place where he's talking to the disciples at the time, but it's all about to change. He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Spirit of God did not live in them prior to the cross and the empty tomb. But he lived with them. How? Through Jesus Christ. Don't forget, Jesus was indwelt by the Spirit of God at his baptism. Remember the dove came down? And Jesus was filled with the Spirit the rest of his life. So they hung out. And then there came a time when Jesus sent them out that he temporarily gave them the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't permanent, but he temporarily gave them the power of the Spirit. So they had interacted with him whether they knew it or not. He dwelleth with them. So number 29, all of the believers' interactions with God the Father and God the Son are through God the Holy Spirit. When you pray, our Father which art in heaven, if God hears you, it's only... So, because of the Holy Spirit living within you. When you talk to Jesus Christ, say, man, I just had wonderful fellowship with Jesus today. The only way that's possible is through the Spirit of God who, who dwells in you. So, all the believers' interactions with God the Father and God the Son are through God the Holy Spirit. Without Him, your connection to God the Father and God the Son, not possible. He is your connection to God the Father and God the Son. Then number 30, last statement, He dwelleth in you. I'm sorry, with you and shall be in you. God, the Holy Spirit, has lived within and does live within every believer in Jesus since Pentecost. No exceptions. Romans 8, Paul says, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of his. He said, if you're not dwelt by the Spirit, you're not saved. Which means the opposite side of that truth, if you're saved, you're indwelt by the Spirit. This is the introduction to the Spirit of God. There's so much more that Jesus says in the rest of chapter 14, chapters 15 and 16. 
But I want us to take home with us tonight a renewed realization, a renewed awareness that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. He's not there to wag his finger at you and say, I caught you. That's, that's not it. He's there to encourage you. He's there to build you. He's there to help you to know God better. Yes, he corrects you. Thank God he does. Because the Bible says if God doesn't chasten you, you are not his child. So praise God that the Spirit of God chastens you. He's there to teach you the Bible. And if I'm not careful, I'll go off on a long list of things that the Spirit of God does in your life and how it affected me when I was 15 and 16 years old. But I beg you to get to know the Spirit of God who dwells inside of you. Let him be real in your life, and you will never be the same again. I'm, con I'm convinced these people that walk away from the faith and say, oh, well, that's phony. It was, I just, no, it was, yeah. I'm convinced that they never fall in love with Jesus Christ. Because if they had, they wouldn't walk away. And they never knew the Holy Spirit who lived inside of them. Because if they did, they would never walk away. I believe once you have real interactions with God, genuine interactions with God, you will never, ever walk away. doesn't mean you won't sin. doesn't mean you won't fail. doesn't mean you won't have dark periods, maybe extended dark periods. But you will never walk away and shut the door and say, ah, it's, there's no God and all that. I'm sorry, you were not saved. You didn't know God. You didn't know God. Father, I pray that you help us tonight to know your precious Holy Spirit. Oh, Spirit of God, I want to know you better. I want to open up more areas of my mind and my heart. I want to take down the barricades that say, do not enter. So that you can flow freely in my life. Oh, dear God, please work in my life. Please work in the life of each person here tonight. Very, very similar invitation tonight to what we had this morning. This morning, as you recall, I invited you to invite the Lord to teach you what it means that your sufficiency is of God. Tonight, I want to ask you to invite the Lord to introduce you to the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, teach you who he is, teach you the role that he wants you to have. In his life, listen, I've been seeking the Lord for this for 40 years. I've made huge progress with God's help, but I'm still seeking. I want, I want the truth. I want to know him. I want God to be real to me. I want everything that the Spirit of God has for me. Would you just talk to the Lord for a moment there as the piano plays?